Hello, everyone. My name is Mickey. I'm the digital marketing manager here at Parsons TKO, and we are a digital transformation consulting agency. Uh, I'm so excited to have all of our panelists here today to talk with you all about leveraging AI tools in the think tank sector. And with that, I will hand it off to Nate Parsons to start our introductions. Thanks, Mickey. Hey, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Nate Parsons. I'm one of the co-founders of Parsons TKO, and uh, I'm a recovering technologist myself and have been following the um, artificial intelligence news with great interest and reading up a lot on it. And I've been you know, starting to do a lot of my own writing and thinking on you know, where I think AI can fit into the mission-driven sector, but, and I think a lot of us are all sort of struggling with that problem. And you know, I'm joined today by some um, very uh, insightful and thoughtful guests who are going to give their perspective as well, and we're just going to explore this question together. And so um, I may uh, hand it over here to um, uh, Fuzz Hogan to introduce himself, and then um, uh, Aleshu uh, Bayak can introduce himself after that, and then we'll have um, uh, Stefan Wayne, who's going to represent PTKO on on this uh, panel discussion. So thank you all for joining us. So that's me. Uh, hi, I'm Fuzz Hogan. Uh, I now work at CNN, but I spent seven years at New America, a uh, think tank in DC um, that, as the bio said, had journalism in its DNA. So it's sort of a natural uh, place for me to be as the head of the head of their comms um, unit since I had a long history of journalism. So that's my background. I've got a, guy, a much longer bio, but I'll save it for now. And Toss it over to Alessio. Thanks, Fuzz. Uh, Alessio Bayak, hi. I'm the uh, now six months into a uh, director of data visualization at Urban Institute, which is a uh, you know, 50 plus year uh, old research, nonprofit research organization, or a think tank doing um, a lot of uh, data driven analyses on uh, issues of social and uh, economic policy. And uh, I come from a long uh, long-ish 12-year career in, in journalism, mostly science and data journalism, and most recently at USA Today. I'll pass it to you. Stefan, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alessio. I'm Stefan Bird Kruger. I'm the head of the data strategy practice at Parsons TKO. Uh, we're a consultancy working with mission-driven organizations. And in my work in particular, we focus on data, not just the collection and sort of technical operations of that data, but really the strategic side of it. How do we identify new uses, new purposes for data within an organization? Um, and then really thinking downstream about how data affects business processes in, in mission-driven organizations. Um, a lot of my background is in the think tank sector. I first spent my first seven years at a, at a think tank in DC. Um, and so really have a lot of, uh, in my heart, uh, a lot of empathy for folks in the think tank sector and the knowledge sector and recognizing that data is more than just the numbers. Data is also the knowledge in its many forms. Data uh, is represented in the research that gets produced. Um, and so thinking about artificial intelligence as a whole new way to operate on that um, and, uh, and to use that data and workflows is tremendous. Tremendously exciting. So I'm, I'm really glad uh, that we were able to get this group together for today's discussion. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, it's great to have you all here. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start off by sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of a little bit of exploration of where AI could fit into the nonprofit and mission driven space. And, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, when a new technology comes out that we're all sort of wondering is like, can I use this, you know, and if we can, you know, what are the safe places to experiment with this while we both like learn how to use this technology effectively and also manage the risk that this new technology might have in it because it's immature and it's still evolving and trying to figure that out. And so you know, I just sort of open this up to all of you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, where and how, you know, artificial intelligence might fit, you know, into the think tank's uh, work or mission, you know, um, in these early days and where, you know, you're sort of exploring that right now. I'll, I'll start. Uh, I, and I probably will give the dumbest answer. So it's good that I start to the, save the best for last. Um, is it seems like at this early, early stage, it would be scale or um, breadth and depth, but not audience facing, if that makes sense, is the sort of summation of where I would come down. In other words, you can get it to do things that a lot of people would have to do or people in places you can't get to for safety or logistical or it's deep under, you know, whatever. Um, but I would be really wary at the general, at the, you know, 10,000 foot level of ever 
it's uh, the the cliche or I don't know if it's a cliche yet, but my internal cliche is it's, it's an army of interns, right? And some interns are ter terrific and should be public facing, but you can't guarantee that a thousand of them will be. So you want to have that same sort of clearing mechanism you have with an interns. Like some are fantastic and go right out, but you want to make sure you're looking at every the work of every intern before it goes out the door. Yeah, that 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 sounds right. And I actually like that <laughs> kind of metaphor, you know, this idea of um, really holding our horses on public facing kind of work and collateral that we would want out there to be produced, um, uh, even if it's QC'd, right, by by these kinds of tools, uh, definitely, a, I think, a step uh, a little too far. Um, so to, to Fuzz's point, you know, we've been looking at at least internally on my team. So I run the data visualization team, you know, for kind of internal processes. And I would imagine coming from, you know, journalism, right, where we are, you know, they, they are, um, you know, embarking on experiments with not so much robo journalism creating, you know, a thousand stories about the latest COVID numbers or baseball box scores. Um, but also looking at internal workflows where we can make shortcuts, right, we can kind of extract text from PDFs or, you know, those kinds of rote tasks. So that's where I think we could all agree. That's where a lot of the experimentation is probably uh, headed at this first stage. Yeah, and I, you know, I think for me, I think our perspective on what AI can do has been skewed a bit by, you know, especially the, you know, the news lately, chat GPT, the whole GPT ecosystem, these large language models. Um, where the focus has been on, look how quickly it can write all this content. Um, and and so, so sort of we naturally gra gra gravitate to the, can this, you know, do my homework for me, get the blog post written, get the social media post written. Um, but for everything that we publish, there is so much that's happening internally. Um, and so I think the real focus needs to be on what are those internal processes where these tools can play a role. Um, and even, you know, take something like ChatGPT, it's good at creating stuff, but it's also really good at just being an interrogative partner. Um, it's good at ask, it's as, as good at asking questions as it is answering those questions. Um, and so using these tools as a way to um, to give give everyone a mentor, you know, you can give every single person a tutor. You can give every single person, um, you know, a thought partner who's available twenty four seven um, to to sort of push and pull and uh, and and just new ways for us to uh, recreate and reimagine some of our internal workflows um, with this new partner that we can have that we can bring into that that process and those questions. Yeah, my mind's already uh, whirring away with thoughts on this. You know, I guess um, one thing I might ask, you know, given that sort of positioning of an army of interns and being able to like sort of reduce the labor internally, you know, what are some of that areas of like analysis or like operational workflow that you think you could sort of set this loose on, you know, and to step into your point, I'd be curious, you know, do you all feel comfortable with the idea of critiquing somebody's work using AI or, you know, offering, a, you know, a counterpoint to somebody's work using AI? I mean, I think it's a really interesting example, um, you know, because one of the things I've seen just in my own research with AI is that it's very good at knowing what the lay of the land is if there's a lot of published material on something. So it can surface the pro and con arguments of an, undis you know, something that's been debated in the media. It's not so great at original critique in my experience, but it does do a good job of servicing what, what's out there. But I'd be curious to hear where you all think it can help and, you know, you know, you know, those uh, interns can be effective. Uh, the one thing that I, again, I, I don't want to keep going first, but the one thing I remember when I first arrived at the think tank where I did work was, and I think this is true of most think tanks, is the life cycle of a comms professional is shorter than the life cycle of the policy analyst, right? So it's almost like use it to know your own self, right? You can never catch up. If I, if I arrive in year seven of a policy program and I want to do typical comms block and tackling, hey, we said something about this six years ago. The policy expert is not thinking that way for various reasons, right? But you are. It's almost like, can this kind of AI tell you about your own organization? And again, just to repeat the, you would then go back to the policy expert is, did we say this in 2014? Can I use this as, can I currently, is this current or is this still what you guys think, right? It's, it's sort of bouncing what Stefan said. It's almost about a bit of a, to know your, own, know your own work and surface that to you internally. And again, screen it internally and then push it back. That seems like one quick opportunity for AI to help you. 
surfaced up internally. Yeah, I, I think that's a it's a really interesting use case, um, particularly because it's right, it's gated, it's kind of behind that that public internal face uh, 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 firewall, right? What you would be able to do some of that QCing, and you know. It, I don't think of it as too different from hiring data scientists or someone to build models or tooling um, to kind of assist in that regard. Um, why should we be relying on something that is then going to be using all of that corpus that we've just fed it um, for whatever products it's, you know, are going to be built on top of it? So I think that's a discussion we need to have in the think tank space um, if we're going to kind of load in that data. But I agree that that use case is is valuable, right? You know, we should have that um, databasing kind of search, uh, you know, you know, surfacing, you know, important keywords, trends, uh, entities, um, et cetera. And you know, I think I'll yeah, I, I agree with with both of those perspectives. Uh, you know, I, I would round out the answer. I think yes, there's a lot that's very exciting. Um, about the current capabilities. And that's the other thing is, you know, the capabilities that we're seeing right now literally didn't exist, you know, in this public way even six months ago. Um, and so what it's capable of is changing so quickly when you look at something like ChatGPT. Um, I, I actually, I think it does a better job at critiquing uh, than uh, I, I know, Nate, your, you know, and your, your experiences when you were testing it. Um, in particular, I think it's, it's not bad at self-critiquing. Um, if you, ask chat GPT something and it gives you an answer and you're like, what is wrong with that answer? It very quickly picks out like, well, this is, this seems implausible what I said. Um, and, uh, and, and this is why, um, and those answers are better. Um, you know, right before we started, Alessia, you were talking about uh, the idea of auto GPT where you can have the model chain itself and, and push itself. I mean, you, you can use these tools in these iterative ways that improves the quality of what you get out of it um, very quickly. Um, and, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm excited about this moment because it's getting everyone to think about AI. Uh, you know, ChatGPT is new, but AI is not actually that new. This has been a field of research for a long time, but it has never felt accessible to us. It has never felt like something that we have either the expertise or the budget to tap into. Um, and, and I think this is showing us that these tools are a lot closer, you know, like you can log into a website and boom, you're using artificial intelligence right now. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it, it could open the door to a lot of much, much more boring uses of artificial intelligence at think tanks, things like classifying our content, um, things like, uh, you know, uh, you know, being able to expand your taxonomy across Across all of your content, because we all know we don't do a great job of that. Um, uh, you know, we, we always miss something uh, and sometimes forget about it for weeks or months at a time. Um, so you can really expand taxonomies and expand taxonomies beyond just the website. You know, how can you use the same taxonomy in your email, in your social, in your fund funding appeals, um, in, your, in your petitions, um, so that all of these things, you have this connective tissue that you can start to have more comprehensively. Um, you know, really like nuts and bolts behind the scenes, but but makes a lot of new uses of content and new uses of data possible uh, when you start looking at all the little opportunities to use AI. Yeah, it's a fascinating time. You know, I was just thinking it reminds me a lot of like the early days of like the search engine world where like people were first starting to realize the web was too big for anyone to have like a list of bookmarks to find things. And then people were trying to figure out how they could find things they hadn't found before. And, you know, people were trading links and things, you know, and it was very archaic compared to today in a lot of ways. But, you know, it's sort of similar kind of period of time for AI and, you know, I think generative, you know, AI in particular. Um, you know, I'm curious, like with this idea of like critiquing yourself and getting to know yourself as an organization and, you know, all those sorts of things sort of assume that the AI is very familiar with your content. And, and I'm really curious that, you know, do you all have thoughts on, you know, what is the role of think tanks as sort of, you know, people who are funding and, and curating expert opinion on various topics and various issues? Like what, what's the sort of ethical role of helping improve, you know, artificial intelligence systems and, you know, you know, giving back to the community in some respects, you know, given that these are still owned by, you know, large commercial entities like Google and Microsoft right now, you know, and it's a little bit similar, I think, to like the debate over Facebook when it started to get big and a lot of nonprofits started to move their um, messaging groups and things onto Facebook, you know, you're seeding a lot of control and curation to these, you know, commercial entities who have different goals and opportunities, but 
you know, the community is heavily leveraging and benefiting from these tools at the same time. So I'm just sort of curious to hear y'all's thoughts on, you know, what is the role of the think tank in that ecosystem? Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, maybe I'm not hyper qualified to be uh, <laughs> suggesting what that sector should be doing. Um, but it does seem like we're at this time, right, where we're in this phase of, you know, uh, you know, substantial growth, like the velocity is is insane right now, um, as are obviously the opportunities and a lot of just, uh, you know, co media coverage and excitement across the board. Um, I, I think that there has there have been folks who who have raised you know issues of regulation. Obviously, you know you can't you can't also <laughs> go a day without hearing uh, about the need for that. Just like when we were hearing it around, um, you know, big tech or 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 any of those issues. It's 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 a little disconcerting, in my opinion, that we're not hearing more from those in the knowledge economy about the red teaming that we need to be doing. And by that, I mean, we need to be poking at these models and seeing what the bad case scenarios are, what the worst case scenario is, uh, how things can be misinterpreted. Um, it's, you know, it, you know, nothing to say nothing of, say, jobs that are going to be replaced, it, I'm talking about literally knowledge jobs that are going to be replaced or edged out? How are we kind of ensuring that whatever our expert opinion is on, on a certain matter or whatever our policy uh, program has shown, is that not going to be completely displaced by some model relying on some data, uh, which we have no uh, kind of view into? And so that's where I think we need to situate um, you know, folks from the academic space and the think tank space, um, as well as obviously the reg regulatory space to be thinking about, um, you know, how we put up guardrails. Yeah, I think yeah, that's just, just to say the same thing in a different way and categorize it like traditional think tank space is research. Some think tanks feel comfortable with advocacy. That's the you talked about, right? So that's the, just that at the highest level, that's what you want to be doing is what's happening and what should be happening. Of course, convening is a nice think tank role, right? Just sort of bringing people together to, again, to address those kind of problems. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I do think, I mean, my favorite example of, as Stefan said, it's it, AI has been around for a while, right? Um, there's a book called Automating Equality that a New America fellow, Virginia Eubanks wrote a while ago. There's a lot, she's not the only one. There's a lot of examples of, uh, states, you know, turn to technology to deliver, to assess and deliver welfare benefits. And I don't have to, in 2023, I don't have to sort of tell you the end of the story, like it didn't go well, right? And so, and the good news, frankly, and Alessia was absolutely right, the good news is a lot easier now, you know, with Maria Ressa and Facebook, and we're seeing all these, it's, it's not hard to wake people up. I think in 10 years ago, it was kind of hard to wake people up, like, hey, there were risks here, like, oh, no, it's going to be great. Right. So there's an advantage, at least uh, politically, sort of, I guess, in a small P way. And and with funders, you're seeing a lot more funders. I think I've had, I haven't been in think tank space for three years, but I assume it's there's a lot more awareness, even though a lot of the funding is from tech and former tech people. Um, uh, that's a got to be careful who you're pitching to. Um, but I think those are all, you know, positive tailwinds. Although a lot of those tech people are are some of the most cynical and concerned about the implications right. of of their creations. That they should know. Yeah, exactly. They're very very. I think there's a lot of awareness there. Um, I, I mean, so many good things to respond to. I think that point about regulation um, is a is a good one because I I think I I think we know that we cannot rely on that. Um, regulation is such a lagging indicator, um, and and so much. I mean, the red team uh, example is uh, is really. I mean, it's happening. It's happening in the wild. Like so many people are actively pushing these tools to do bad things, um, and that's making the headlines. You know, as much as the capabilities are, um, and, and yet we, yeah, we we see these worst case examples, but we don't have real centers of excellence yet. Where are the groups that say we have found the safe path? Like we know what these guardrails are, and I would love for the think tank sector to be the place where this happens because they have the mandate. They have the mandate to 
use tools, use processes to extract knowledge. Um, you know, Nate, I think one of the place one of the places I thought you were going to go to with your question was, um, what do we even need think tanks anymore? If we have these models that can like do all the work, can process all the inputs, can come up with the insightful outputs, um, and and I think I think I, uh, you know he says cynically, um, I I think that the the role of the think tank is to be that place of convening. I think you said it precisely right, Fuzz, and it's a place where you can create frameworks for how policy analysis occurs. You can have these frameworks for what are what are the common goals that a whole bunch of thought leaders are trying to achieve in any one moment. Um, I think it's a I think it provides this really useful vehicle for making sure that we're doing safe and uh, uh, responsible things with our policy analysis. Um, it's it's that ethical layer that we can layer on top of the the ability to produce in infinite insights, infinite findings. Um, uh, there's there's that level of of judgment and curation that that we put on top of it. Yeah, you see, you've, everyone's lost in thought here. I can see everybody worrying on that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just to follow up on that. I mean, I do think we're we're in an interesting time um, in the information economy overall. You know, there has been a lot of economic incentives over the last 10 years to move from an open and free sharing of information to these like closed gardens. And, you know, that's happened for a very variety of reasons. Some people want, you know, cleaned up and curated and, you know, um, official sounding news, you know, commercial entities want to hold on to the profits and their ability to advertise to people and to, you know, manage that user data that they're gathering from having those people there. You know, and you can see that one of the challenges that, you know, chat GPT in particular as an AI system is going to bring is this idea that you go to a place and you get an authoritative answer to a question and there's no competing um, other information showed to you, you know, in the current, um, you know, way that people often look for information, if you search in Google, you see, you know, pages of results, and sometimes you can see counterpoints within those results. And so it's not that you're seeing just one perspective um, at a time. But with chat GPT, you only get one perspective in your answer, you know, you ask it a question, you get one answer back, you don't get 10 answers side by side, showing different angles of things. And so I'm sort of curious to, you know, to that extent, like, you know, is AI a competitor to think tanks in terms of policy analysis and influencing people? And, you know, what is sort of the challenge between having, you know, somebody go to a think tank directly for that information versus, you know, going to one of these systems that in theory is aggregating information from all over the internet and from many think tanks, but maybe is giving a, you know, incorrect answer or an inauthentic answer or a biased answer in the worst case, that's, you know, programmed by somebody behind the scenes for their own, you know, political objectives. Uh, I mean, I, I'm wary of speaking of CNN, but just as an example, like we're CNN and we're not YouTube, right? Uh, if you're equating a news organization with Google, that's the audience's problem, right? And so if your brand as a think tank is we're going to be full analysis, screen, whatever you want, you know, uh, cohesion around the great wild information. If you're equal to ChatGPT, then that's a problem for the think tank, but it's also a problem for the audience if they're actually not seeing a distinction, right? Uh, again, it goes both ways. It could be the think tank problem and they're not providing qualitatively better, you know, content than a ChatGPT. If the audience is the same, then that's the problem. Yeah, you know, it reminds me of the kind of data and information and news literacy debates, right? Where, you know, we can we can kind of impose a lot of, uh, you know, red flags and extra context and try to kind of preempt what, uh, you know, people are going to interpret from a single thing, right? Be it YouTube, be it Twitter, be it Parler, you know, um, or, or, you know, a, a news site. That's, it gets back to the kind of, crux of that debate, which is, well, whose responsibility is it to kind of guide and shepherd uh, society into finding information crucial to a functioning uh, democracy, right? So that's that's really harsh and, and, and a hard problem. What it reminds me of is chat GPT is such, at least in, I think, the way most people are, are experiencing it, a very kind of linear or like, you know, kind of two step or I, I'm not kind of explaining right but you're basically just 
inputting and outputting, inputting and outputting. That's not how knowledge is created. That's yes. not how science works. Um, yep. That's not how the UX should be set up. Um, so how do we try to do what think tanks are great at, what news organizations are uh, you know, hopefully great at, which is providing nuance, which is shedding light on not just the black and the white, but the gray in the middle. And I think that we're seeing from a lot of the outputs that you're a, a definitive answer is 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 oversimplifying. I mean, yeah, so well said, Alessio. Uh, and you know, knowledge, knowledge itself does not have inherent value. Like knowledge is valuable valuable in its application. Knowledge is valuable when we use it for a purpose. Um, and so I think when you're looking at think tanks, you have to look at the whole apparatus of a think tank. Like a think tank is, it's not just the scholars, you know, churning out PDFs. Um, yeah, there's been lots of lots of studies on this, you know, the value of a PDF by itself. Um, but, uh, you know, I think in, in this era where knowledge becomes cheaper, like, you know, let's, uh, let's just call it that, um, the the value of a think tank is is in the gr team um the value of the think tank is in the, the combination of the you know government relations and the comms function um and the convening and the events function um it's in the fact that we can use this knowledge with a purpose and we can use this knowledge as a part of a community um with a real focus towards some sort of you know societal impact um so i i think it, it's everything that's downstream of that knowledge in addition to the ability to produce and curate that knowledge in the first place um, this, you know, this doesn't dismiss the value of that research, you know, that is the foundation of all the other work. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it is, it is, it is really important that we look at the entire integrated apparatus of a think tank um, as, as what retains value in this increasingly competitive knowledge landscape. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just challenging. I think when these new technologies come in, they're very disruptive, you know, and I think there is often a push and pull between like good actors and bad actors in terms of how they're used. And, you know, I mean, just even how they end up sort of settling into the marketplace, I think, you know, requires a lot of active, you know, stewardship for it to be in a good place. Um, you know, maybe along those lines, I'm really curious, like, you know, if you were to sort of fight fire with fire, like, you know, what can AI enable think tanks to do differently or allow them different sorts of engagement with users you know, that they might not be getting today. You know, one of the simple ones I think about is that, you know, we do a lot of interviews with people and we'll often use AI to summarize some of the key points or tell us where the points of conflict were within a conversation, you know, and it does a very good job of saying, hey, in this information, I can summarize and find some things that are interesting to you. And it's not a guarantee that it gets everything, but it's dramatically cut down on the labor and our ability to, you know, use those um, conversational you know, tidbits more effectively and usefully in our own work. And so I'm sort of curious, you know, as you all think about using AI internally, what are some of the ways you might want to, you know, give audiences new experiences that aren't possible today, either through labor constraints or, you know, like physical construction constraints or anything else that you could see it, it really benefiting from? Because I do think it's one of those things where, you know, if it's one-sided, it won't turn out the way anybody wants, you know? Well, it seems we need to uh, to use it as a force multiplier, right? So in, in various kinds of um, applications, right, from research design and kind of assisting in data collection, data analysis, uh, uh, Stefan uh, uh, mentioned earlier, classifiers, right? You know, we could be uh, kind of using them to augment the kind of expert uh skills that we have right in 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 our fellows and in our analysts right who are say coding uh massive data sets um along categories right oh that's suddenly a multi-class classifier could we feed this to ai we've already been you know people have already been experimenting that with that before chat gpt was released um and i also think of things like you know real worst case scenarios where you have uh, a whole spider of 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 tens of thousands of 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 uh phishing emails being sent out uh you know a, a minute right to be sent okay so so how do we use that kind of um or imagine that kind of uh system being applied to how we gather knowledge around a specific research question right could we use this to you know in in instead of other other systems that are a little or a lot slower than that and so that would be a kind of a positive spin on that kind of capability. Yeah, I, I think I'm building off that, but I, that, it, to say that the other, like, can it go another challenge for a comms person 
is especially at a you know place like where I work where there are new programs a lot is I didn't know the audience that this person was trying to reach or they didn't know the audience they were trying to reach they had some so so can chat can an AI go hear what that audience is talking about right um, in a way that is either I'm on kid bullets it's a time saver or just and understand the audience's needs an audience I otherwise wouldn't be able to reach or hadn't reached before I have no history with and I had a question which had just occurred to me so I haven't had a chance to research it is can you ask these tools to approach the research from an audience perspective right can it can it either as it looks right I want you to look through this data set as if you were a character who you know or two to the thing Stefan talked about earlier can you deliver it to an audience of nope this I need legislators this time nope I need school superintendents this time nope I need people who live in East LA right can you have it those are things to think about is yeah. can something can do that kind of scale 100 percent. I mean th that's like one of the big you know the the new field that's emerging is prompt engineering how do you prompt these AIs and that's like one of the the classic uh, AI tuning steps is you start anything you're going to say to chat GPT with pretend you are a blank, pretend you are a legislator, pretend you are a sixth grader, pretend you are a grandmother, um, you know, whatever you want to do. And then it, it adopts that mindset in the way it uses its language. Um, and so, so yeah, extremely tunable, but I mean, I think you're touching on the, the real thing here, which is its ability to process tremendous inputs at speed. Um, so you think about this AI as a part of your social listening paradigm. You think about this AI as a part of your, um, uh, you know, let's say membership uh, model where you're trying to curate something for a longtime member who's had all kinds of interactions with you over the years. Uh, and again, you were just hired on and you've got this like 20 year relationship that you're supposed to steward um, or as a fundraiser doing the same thing. You know, the ability, you know, those types of research activities are typically measured in in months if you're trying to do it for a whole population. Um, you know, you think about focus groups and surveys. Uh, what's the turnaround time on those? When you're trying to do something today in a, you know, let's say a news cycle, it, it just doesn't work for real tactical operations. Um, but with AI, you can do things at, at these tactical speeds, like something news just broke. Um, what's going on this morning? And you pop all this into a model uh, and you get these sort of summary outputs. And then you pop in all of your content that you've ever produced. Um, and you say, which of that content? Content is most relevant, um, and let's try to surface that. Um, it's it's like a, a super powered um, and much more nuanced uh, internal search system um, that you can develop and external search. Um, so yeah, you, you can stitch together a lot of things once you start looking at all of your systems, all of your audience engagement touch points as you know it's data, um, but uh, you know in a much more rich, qualitative, and nuanced sense um, that you can start to leverage. Yeah, I mean, that makes me kind of wonder, you know, I think there's there's a sort of push and pull that I hear in that in the answers here, which is that, you know, on the one hand, it does have this incredible ability to scale your operations in certain ways, you know, it can do many things very quickly, it can slice and dice things, you know, with nuance and with fine levels of detail, you know, and that might tempt, you know, me as an outsider to say, oh, well, maybe this could be a really good ask the expert tool on your website or something where, you know, you can ask it a question and it would respond. But, you know, yeah, I see you shake your head, uh, Fuzz, and I think you're probably thinking the same thing I am, which is like, if nuance is important for asking the question, maybe it's going to be tough to get it to provide expert answers. So, yeah, I just kind of love to hear your thoughts on things like that, because I do think that's going to be something that people start selling, right? I remember when chatbots came out and everybody was like, oh, everybody should have a chatbot on their site so you can ask you questions about things. But then pretty quickly people were, you know, disillusioned with the quality of the chatbot experience. But I'm really curious where you all think, you know, as AI comes in and there's pressure to use it to create custom data sets or to respond to particular queries, how you might think about deploying it or not. <laughs> This is where I, I, in an email to the group, I was an absolutist, and I, this is why I will, I will return to my absolutist stance. AI, this, these tools should not be public facing for at least, so the next time we have this conversation, at least a year away. I would not, it's too, way too risky for the organization to, if you're promising the world that you are telling the truth and you're never wrong, don't hand over that brand to a robot. And if you're telling the world that a robot can do our job, what are you saying about yourself?
Yeah, I mean, agree, right? It ha- it's like that internal external, right? Like this, sh- these should be pressure tested at an internal uh, kind of processes and 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 shortcuts and force multipliers. But for sure, you know, be very wary of of releasing things into externally, in- including right things that may have been uh, copy edited and produced internally with this assistance. Um, that stuff probably needs an extra layer or two uh, of of editing. Um, I wouldn't really trust any of the literature review that it had been doing or, or any of that yet. And, and the other thing is just to be the journalist out here. And so you, I'm sure it says the same thing, unless you that at some point you have to, if the, these two things are so related, you have to be transparent about if these tools were involved, right? Yeah. Um, and so... And it's one of the checks, like, well, we have to say this. So since we have to say this, do we want to tell the world we did this? Right. And if you don't want to tell the world you did this, then don't do it. Right. It could be innocent ways. I can imagine if I thought a little, there probably would be innocent ways to say like chat GPT helped us come up with these things, but, uh, or did this research, but you have to, it's, if, if you're comfortable telling the world you did it, then you can do it. But if you're not comfortable telling the world you can, you, you did it, then you shouldn't do it. Sorry. And yet. <laughs> I agree. I agree completely with everything you both just said. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a little bit. You know, qualifier. I agree completely. And yet, people are going to do it. Both yeah. organizations are going to do it. We are going to see ChatGPT powered, you know, knowledge assistance, um, you know, Clippy on steroids. Um, but, and I think beyond that, the audiences we are trying to influence are already doing this. They are already using ChatGPT as an alternative to finding the resources that we produce as a sector. Um, so, so you know, recognizing that competition, you know, it's 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 uh, adapt or yield to these alternative sources. So, so we have to face the tremendous pressure that we are going to have to modernize the user experience, um, make that knowledge better curated, more accessible. Um, and, and these are the best tools for doing that right now. So I, I, think, I think recognizing that challenge is, uh, is really important for think tanks. Um, you know, what we're doing, we're not doing it in isolation. We are doing it in a very shifting uh, digital landscape with, with shifting audience expectations. Um, and, and this is where I think it is so important to have these guardrails because recognizing it's going to happen. Um, you know, I, you know, as I said before, we could, you can throw all these things, throw all your data into these systems. Um, I would never trust, you know, whatever version I'm on and whichever platform I'm accessing it through, whether it's open AI or Microsoft's, um, I would never trust all of my organization's data throwing all of it into that platform whole cloth um, with, you know, who, who knows what the terms of conditions are today. Um, uh, so I think we have to really be thinking about what are the different ways we can access these capabilities. You can have your own version, your own owned model um, where it is your data on your platforms and it's not going to anyone else. So I think there's a lot to think about in terms of how we engage it. And then I think most importantly, you know, we, I, I agree completely. Uh, if you are going to put ChatGPT on your homepage in a little bubble um, that people can talk to you right now, you're taking an unacceptable brand risk. Um, but how can you test that capability um, to know when you've gotten good enough at using it where perhaps it is safe enough? And that's where those internal use cases are going to be absolutely essential. We have to have these cultures of experimentation internally in think tanks. Um, if we're not playing with it, if we're not, if we're not really pressure testing it, you know, as you said, you know, the red team, you know, trying to see what are the, how far can this go before it breaks? How far can it go before it hallucinates something that is damaging to our, you know, our brand and reputation? Um, and, uh, and that's where I, you know, I think having an internal chatbot, you know, whoever is going to be responding externally should have the tool we don't yet trust the public with, because they will be that last gate, that last filter. Um, so it, I, I think it changes. It changes what the day looks like for a lot of think tank uh, staff if they are going to try to keep up with with these technologies. Yeah, and it it back to transparency again. It's another opportunity for this conversation. Like I, I can think of in the journalism sphere, and I'll stick to the think tank sphere. Is your funding transparency right? You're transparent. Who some think tanks are, some think tanks aren't. 
even in the R transparent category, some are more transparent than others. And using transparency as a brand attribute, right? If you are one of those think tanks that you think you're the whitest of white hats, right? Then saying like, we are, we have a funding table. You can tell exactly not only what they fund, but all our papers have a funding, you know, who is funding this paper, that kind of thing. And so if you're the kind of think tank that has a really strong position, either whatever along the, whatever part of the spectrum you're on, say it, right? And start to delineate a link along the think tank ecosystem. These are the think tanks that say this, and these are the think tanks that haven't, right? And so you start to say like, well, we're the, we're the kind of think tank that is transparent about use of chat GPT. Those are not, right? Not to be super competitive because it's a nice, generally a nice world, but to the, if you start to live in that world, that Stefan's right, there's gonna be pressure, right? So the way to react to that pressure is to sort of be transparent about whether which choices you're making so the audience knows what to expect when they come. And, and then and they can see, therefore, that the ones that aren't transparent, whether that, that they trust them or not anyway, that's their choice as an audience member. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's so important because, I mean, in a good example of that is uh, Wired Magazine recently put out an article where they explained what they're going to use chat GPT and other generative technologies for and what they're not. And it was, you know, I think it was really illuminating because they just sort of said, hey, here's how it's going to be. And, you know, you can, you'll know when we do this kind of thing that, you know, AI is involved or it isn't involved. And, you know, I think one of the things that that's always been true in the US in the modern times has been that we give technology companies a pass on ethics and on decorum, you know, and I think that, you know, this is another place where there's some obvious things, especially with things like, you know, chat GPT that we all know things should do, but we're not enforcing in the community, I don't think is putting enough pressure on these companies to do, which is, you know, and, and, most literature, it's common practice to cite your sources, you know, and to say like, hey, I got this information from here. And that's not a common thing in chat GPT responses. It very rarely links you to the sources. It often will- Or it makes them up. That's the right. term. Yeah, it makes right? them up. Yeah. sort of said, this guy did this thing and here's a footnote. It's like an invalid footnote. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And in science, it, you know, things change and in policy, things change and chat GPT rarely puts the date of where it got a position from too. So it might be something that was, you know, the 1970s position instead of the 2023 position on a policy issue or something like that. And so I do think part of it, you know, is, is being really public too about the things that we expect and want these technologies to do and to like put pressure on how they're actually designed and developed. Because I think like one of the things that's happened you know, with Facebook and other things is we, they kind of started out feeling innocuous to society and then they became so large, but they were entrenched with a lot of the ethics and rules and ideas that they were going to, you know, expand into from the early days. And I do think with there's an opportunity here for think tanks to put a lot of pressure on these companies publicly to like say, hey, here's how these answers should actually be structured even. And here's what, you know, an ethical response looks like. And, you know, I, I think that's something that, you know, if it doesn't happen, it won't happen. You know, it'll continue to be the way it is now where it tries to, you know, get away with as little as possible, you know, because I think that'll be cheaper and easier for everybody, you know. Um, yeah, we've actually, yeah, we're, we're making great progress. We've got some really good questions in the Q&A. So I might uh, throw a few of those out there for the team. Um, one of them that was interesting sort of around the red teams was, you know, are there is there work that needs to happen this year to sort of combat the inevitable like you know AI powered misinformation campaigns that are coming with the you know presidential election and the other things that will incite a lot of actors to get out there and start using these technologies to like do even more quote unquote fake newsing and you know trying to public manipulation like are there things think tanks should work on this year to sort of help prepare for that? I mean, I ha I have an answer, but it's actually based in work that I know LSU has done. Um, I, I think there is a, a media monitoring and social media monitoring function in terms of active, you know, we are doing active combat with misinformation um, and, and the think tank sector is, is a big part of that. Um, there are of course think, tank, think tanks that specialize in this, but given that this misinformation is gonna happen across all issues, it's gonna happen across all uh, you know, uh, subject areas, it's gonna just accelerate a lot of the combating myths and misinformation that has been happening. Um, I, think, I think all think tanks need will have a responsibility. I mean, you are guardians of your issues. Um, you are guardians of the public uh, mindset around your issue. Um, I think I think everyone needs to have some function where they are monitoring this. And, and can we use AI to do that faster? I don't know. You tell me, Alessia. <laughs> 
And I've uh, done that work well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think that in my brush with natural language processing, not natural language generation, um, you know, I, I had been looking a lot at the social media listening space and other kinds of, you know, corpora that you can, you can start to try to pick out trends. Uh, it become it's, it's easier when you know what you're looking for. Obviously, it's much harder when you're saying, give me something that kind of sounds like this. Uh, and give me something so, untrue. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, and we know it's, it's very difficult. Um, yeah, to kind of predict what the next wave of misinformation uh, strategy is going to look like. Um, but I agree with you that, you know, those that are guardians of that issue uh, want to get out ahead of it, or they want to be probably clued in as soon as possible, relying on these kinds of tools, um, not necessarily J chat GPT, but the, the system that it's built on, right? Learning uh, about how to um, kind of ingest data at that scale. Maybe you're you're partnering with a consultancy if it's this close to your business model, um, uh, some kind of firm. I mean, I know that, look, with the birth of social media came, you know, <laughs> a thousand uh, uh, flowers bloomed, right, of these social media tracking and marketing analytics firms you're going to probably see the same thing, right? With how do we tune these large language models to your business case? And in the same way, think tanks, we're probably, we're probably going to see that kind of, kind of grow. And that could help us respond more quickly to those issues of uh, misinformation or news cycles that we would want to peg to. Yeah, I would echo the same thing. I just, the more that think tanks can pre buttle Right. I think we're learning that pre buttle is, is as effective, not something as more effective um, than coming after the fact checking. As I mean, we do a lot of fact checking here, uh, but I think the think tank's role would be we see applications here. And again, back to the convening, you know, gather some of the political operatives and say, what would you, how would you see to use this if you were nefarious and start to publish and talk about those, those use cases? So people are ready for it, both journalists and Probably more journalists, because I think it's kind of hard for a think tank to reach a mass audience, but sort of get ahead of that game. But can AI help those think tanks get in front of journalists? That's, that's another question. Uh, <laughs> it's the, if, if AI can <laughs> free pizza, then definitely. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> I, I think you, there's a there's a piece of this that, I mean, it has to be said, um, and I don't know how many of our listeners are coming from the philanthropy side of think tanks, um, but this, this is going to be a new capability that think tanks need to develop in whichever part of it, using it internally, operationally, using it for that external sort of situational awareness, using it for the content generation, using it for the rebuttal, the pre-buttal. All of this is new. Um, I mean, I, I, mean, I want to thank Fuzz and LSU for being here. It was hard to build a panel for this this conversation because nobody feels like an expert yet. Well, um, I was going to ask you, Stefan. <laughs> you you talked about the and I built the 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 prompt whisperer, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for the audience, for anybody <laughs> out in the world, like, what are the as far as you can tell, what are the adjacent skills? Yeah. Right. Is it a liberal arts major who can like you know shape the language? Is it human or is it a more of a tech? like understanding how the technology works person, or is it somebody who, you know. I, heard, I can't remember the name of, uh, of the person or the publication, but I read, uh, I read an interview with someone who, who is now a prompt engineer. Um, and, uh, and she was struggling in that job of figuring out how to get the, the uh, AI to do, you know, just the right thing. And her boss explained uh, writing prompts for AI as uh, as casting spells, um, so it's it really is like you use exact you know just the wrong word or just the wrong you know phrasing uh, or say it in the wrong context and you're going to get a completely different outcome. Um, so it is very much an art form as much as it is a science, um, and sort of you know learning how these things are responding and learning how they change as they grow in power. Um, you know it's something it's there's something very mystical about it. Um, but um, yeah yeah it's. You know, we. I feel like I feel like now I I can anticipate Wordle's mind. Yeah, Wordle's <laughs> yeah exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be yeah. Can can uh, can ChatGPT predict the next Wordle word? That's. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, the point I was getting at is these are going to be new capabilities that there isn't existing staff. There isn't existing staff time. 
it, think tanks are going to need resources to do this. And so I think there's going to be a big change. Um, there is a, an enormous need for funding. Um, and again, it's not just for think tanks that are focused on this as a problem. I think all think tanks need to be able to steer into this capability. Um, so, I mean, we got to open the floodgates right now. Please, if you're, if you're here and you fund think tanks, um, talk to your think tank about what they need um, uh, to, to, to lean into this as a new uh, you know, field of capabilities. We can't, yeah, we cannot hide um, from AI. It is a part of society now. Um, we cannot put this genie back in the bottle. Uh, we cannot close the box uh, out of which Pandora arose. I don't know. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> I just want to tag on that a little bit, though. Just like, I don't think there's really anything too new under the technology sun. Like, as much as, you know, we advance things in chat, GBT and AI seem novel, I do think we actually have a very well developed skill set for prompt engineering. It's just in a, a place most people don't think, which is, research librarians have been learning how to do this for years and years with card catalogs and, you know, looking through publications that don't use the same terminology and things like that. And I remember there was a great crisis in the library world about 15 years ago where many librarians were seeing the downsizing and, you know, their libraries moving to digital collections where people never came into the physical space. And most of those folks end up trying to go into the user experience world and using their taxonomy skills and things like that to do like content operations work and things. But, you know, if this had just come a little earlier, I think a lot of those folks would have gone into this because I do think there's an extremely high overlap between getting the most out of like, um, you know, chat and, you know, generative AI and, you know, these kind of large language models and research librarian skill sets, you know, and I think that that's one of the things that's, you know, I think hopeful about, you know, these things is that we actually do have people who could help us use them better, you know, just that, like a lot of disruptive technologies, they're going to move industries and we're gonna have to rethink and reclassify and be open to their expertise in a new place, you know, but I do think those folks, folks are out there and I just don't think they're often hired by the organizations that are facing these challenges. And I think that's one of the big, you know, societal upheaval moments here. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're closing in on time and we've got, I mean, an, a very active conversation going both here and in the chat, which is great. So I will say uh, I, for the questions we don't get to today, we'll try and pull some answers together and send them in follow up, a follow up email. So don't worry if we haven't gotten to your question today. Um, you know, I think one thing that I might um, lead us out here in the last couple of minutes is uh, there was a question in the chat. How should people sort of, um, you know, think about using AI who are skeptical due to the risks or the biases? Like, what is a safe way to experiment or explore these technologies? And I, I kind of wonder if you all have some of the your own learnings or th thoughts on that. Like, how can somebody kind of dip their toe in this in a way that kind of lets them get more educated, maybe even before it becomes a you know line of business tool for them? I mean, these guys have, have done more of it than I am, but I, my own personal experience is just play around. Just like if you, if, if there's a lot of opportunities that um, I don't think you're changing your Amazon or Apple algorithm if you do these things. I mean, maybe you are, but like depending on what you ask it, uh, it's the only risk really is that you change your identity to the marketers of the globe. Um, but generally, I think there's lots of opportunity to simply just go to ChatGPT and type in some stuff and see what happens and to change the journey, how the journey will land you. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, yeah, the question was, how do you pitch using AI to folks who are skeptical? Um, uh, you know, I don't know if you're trying to pitch people internally because you want them to just get started and get using it, or if this is about pitching your funder. Um, but I mean, I do think the keeping up with the Joneses is, uh, you know, it's a pretty strong argument um, because it is. I mean, things are accelerating. Um, the the expectations of us and our roles are going to shift um, as this technology continues to take root. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a piece of it. Um, I think, you know, if it's just, uh, will will something bad happen if I use it? Um, you know, it is important to remember it, it is still in a box, you know, these tools, um, you know, by itself, it is not integrated to all kinds of things that are going to, you know, delete your database and uh, and do other, you know, dangerous, scary things. Um, so it, it's in a, a bit of a sandbox still. Um, and and I think it's just important to, to make the promise that we will try to use it responsibly, um, that we have spent time thinking about this. We have spent time thinking about the risks of just copy pasting. Um, we have spent time thinking about the, the risks 
risks of doing anything that's public facing and, and promising that we will only use it internally. Um, uh, really, I think writing down the rules of the road for how you intend to use it and how you want people to use it um, so that you can just you know, directly address those risks and point out where you're avoiding them and the way that you're gonna use it. Um, I think that's a, that's a really important thing. I think coming at ChatGPT with a purpose, um, you know, this is how I hope it can help us. And, and this is why I think this way that we're gonna use it will be relatively safe. Well, that's a, a hopeful, hopeful answer. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I'm not sure we have time for another question. I think it may, may uh, spin us off into future things, but I want to just thank you all for, for joining us and, and you know, Fuzz um, and uh, LSU especially. We really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and your insights with us. And, you know, we will be sending a follow-up email to everybody who came today with hopefully some more answers and some more thoughts on uh, questions we didn't get to in the chat. But yeah, it's, a, it's an open world and you can see the discussion is just starting. So we hope to continue to, to think on this and bring people together to talk about it and explore together and um, hopefully, you know, put some uh, some pressure on this tech companies to do this in a smart and ethical way where we all, you know, benefit as a society from these technologies. So yeah, thank you. Um, we appreciate everyone coming.